So, hello everyone. Today we are going to go through chapter 18, expressions. And hopefully you can see my screen. If not, then let me know. But I think it's still good. All right. So, um, the chapter starts by doing uh, like a simple example and the motivation of why you should understand expressions. And so it starts by saying, okay, let's do this simple operation. So you have X times 10, and then you want that into a variable Y. And then if you are starting in a clean environment, that immediately will give you a, an error saying, well, I don't know what X is. Like there's no X in your environment. And so then the motivation is how, it would be cool if we could save this as the intent of doing something. So I want to compute something, which will be a variable x times 10, and then store that in y. Oh, I don't want to run that immediately, So, uh, but I want to store that. And so the way we store that is by creating an expression. Oh, so we just um, run that same expression and uh, with our line uh, column column expression and so z will have that object not the result but just what we want like so the intent of uh, computing this and so later on we could just define our x uh, variable and then we can go to uh, eval which is it comes from the base base r and so if we do evil z and we previously define x, then it will give us what we we're expecting. Uh, and then uh, section two, it, called, it talks about the abstract syntax trees, which, well, there's some kind of notation that you have to keep in mind to understand how they work. Is that, uh, well, at the left, more left leftmost position that's where you have a the function um, you're actually executing and so everything that comes after that uh, it will be the parameters to that function or the argument and there are some colors here that you can see and the purple ones are what they call symbols and i'll show you what symbols are in a bit then you can have strings and you can have constants and the way you read them is from left to right. So you say function f calls with x, a, a string y, and a constant one. And then you can have, of course, more complex uh, trees, and which what it means here is you have f, which calls t, which is called with one and two, which calls also h with three and four, and another call to function i. Mm -hmm. uh, so every call in R can be written in a tree form. And if you remember in chapter six, we uh, talk about the infix, yeah, infix notation or prefix, prefix notation. So well, we have this, which is infix. So you have x times 10, but then that can be written as a prefix notation well, we first we have the assignment function, and then we have two parameters, uh, y, and then this expression, which is again rewritten as in prefix notation with the function um, star, and then the parameters to that x and then. And so both of these will generate this ASD. Mm -hmm. Um, a more formal definition of an expression. Um, so any member of the set of base types created by passing code. So you can pass, pass constants, scal scalars, symbols, call objects, and pair lists. Um, and I think here we'll discuss um, scale, uh, constant symbols and call objects. Uh, scalars and pair lists are said to be uh, more bands, and those are discussed in section six of the chapter. Mm. So constant, uh, well, a constant is 
basically a it can be a null or a and then an element of length one. So you can have a verbal, then you can have a string, you can have a billion, you can have an in year. And with R line is syntactic syntactic literal, then you can test if it's like a boolean, if that's a a constant or syntactic literal. Then we have symbols, which are just name of, of objects. Uh, for example, X or empty cards where they said there are two ways you can define these symbols. Uh, you can capture a reference with our line expression. So we saw that before in the very first example. Or you can turn a, a string into a symbol using our line uh, colon colon sim. And so here are the examples you have a uh, variable X, and then you say, well, I want to capture that. As, a, uh, as an expression. And the output of that will be the same as we say R line sim. So convert this into a symbol. So it converts X into a symbol. And then of course you can uh, convert back from a symbol to a string. And then you could do that by using as character or R line as a string. You could do uh, multiple conversions uh, multiple symbols with our long sims. And so I think you just pass a list per vector. Okay, next we have the calls. So a call is just a capture function call. So you call a function and that's what they're capturing the function call. So that's a, that's what they call here, a call. Uh, and so for example, we have this expression, read table and some file and some argument. Then we can capture that with our line expression. Uh, the funny thing, which I guess that's some design stuff is that if you call the type of that expression or that call, it's language, which I don't know, I just find be odd. Why it would be language? Who knows? But then uh, there's a more useful function that if you say it's a call, so it will tell you if it's a call or not. And something that I find found useful is that when you, for example, store a call to a function, or you capture, sorry, a function call, it's a list. And so you can access the objects or the elements of that function call as as you were to access a the elements in a list and so for example you want to access what is the function being called so then you access element one and then if you want to access the parameters to that function then you just get rid of the first element likewise you could uh, use the dollar sign and if the arguments are named so you can access, for example, row names by saying X dollar sign row names. And you could add new um, components to that function call. So I think read table has a, uh, what was it? Maybe call names, I'm not sure. But then you could say X dollar sign, whatever the other argument is, and then give it a value. So that's how you amend a function, the, a function hold that has been captured. Uh, then there's the function position, which is the first element of the call object. So something interesting here is that sometimes your function doesn't live in your environment. So you want to call your function from a package or you want to call your function from an R6 object or uh, that's, that comes from another function as there is of the output is of another function. So uh, here are the examples. If you are to have a, a call from a package, then you're gonna have this extra um, call here or extra symbol. Uh, same with uh, if you have an R6 object or a call to another function. You can build a call to an object using R line call to, which you will take as the first uh, argument a 
a string. Well, you can take a string with the name of the function. And then after that, you pass uh, the, the arguments to that function. And so here we're using our line expression because we want to capture the intent of uh, this x variable. We don't want to validate it. Uh, alternatively, you could do a expression instead of a string here. So you do our line expression and then where the function is coming from. So face back. Uh, so you might wonder how does a string transform becomes an expression? So, uh, well, there's a lot of stuff in the background happening, but then uh, what's happening is it's something called parsing. And so what parsing is, imagine you have this string and then you split it in tokens or, the, or, the smallest, or smaller pieces. So you have X, you have token, uh, plus which is function call and then you have y and so then you match that to i'm calling it a template but what it is is a set of rules so r uh, or any programming language has a grammar that defines what kind of uh expressing expressions are valid and which ones are not so by parsing that and matching it to a grammar that's how you do the conversion from a string to an expression or code. Um, keep in mind the operator precedence. And so I guess you're all familiar with this. And so this is the classic, uh, the times and division takes precedence over uh, subtraction and addition. Um, and so here's just the, the three for this expression. Um, it says to watch out for the negation uh, function because uh, it, it is loosely bind, they said. So I don't have an example here, but if you have something like uh, no x and another variable, we'll do first the n expression and then we'll do the negation of that. So I think um, the whole thing here is if you want to be sure that it's doing what you want, you should use parentheses. So you force the operator's uh, precedence that you want. Um, it says more operators are left associative, which means then you compute from left to right. Um, and so, well, it, the addition, it's associative in either, in either direction. But then there are two exceptions for that, which are the uh, exponentiation. So it doesn't go from left to right, but the other way in pairs, I guess. So two to the power of three, and then that to the power of two. And same for the assignment. And I don't know you, but I use this one, like this kind of thing, chain a lot in when I'm doing a package. Because uh, when I do a package, I usually add a local binding. So at the top of my function, you'll see I have something like x assign uh, y assign z, and then assign null. So what I'm saying is, I want all of those three variables to be initialized with null. And I don't know if it's good, but I do it all the time. Because otherwise, uh, when I am um, checking the package, it gives me a note that if I try to send that to the CRAN, they will send it back saying, oh, you're not supposed to have that. <laughs> we don't like that, that those notes. Um, more parsing, uh, you can parse a code from a string. So imagine you have a string like this and how do you convert that into, well, if you say, is that a call? Or well, say, no, that's just a string. But then you can do our line parse expression. And so now that is a, a call or expression. So if you say is a call, then you say yes, it's a call. Um, Deparsing, uh, so it's going the other direction. You have an expression and then you want to get a string out of it for some reason. And so you will do expression 
underscore text that oops sorry <laughs> that was a surprise uh and so the only thing here there was a note saying that when you are deparsing you have to keep in mind that you might lose like the spaces and comments and that kind of thing because then that nothing that is not evaluated it usually just goes away so and i do have homework for you <laughs> <laughs> you have to read sections five and six and the thing the reason is because i wasn't sure how to like summarize those two sections because i felt like they were like heavily like um like there were too much stuff going on in those two sections and so i didn't bother in <laughs> adding slides for those but you can read those two and if you're familiar with d2l then you can send those via d2l or desire to learn. And that's it. Um, it was very short. And I hope that makes sense. Well, basically, this is just the building blocks for what comes next. So like just to understand um, strings and how you convert expressions, how you capture an expression. And yeah, um, I mean, if you have any questions or if you have any interesting application application of this, maybe Steven, I have. Um, I tried the last like 18, well, I tried a, a lot of the exercises, but the last one, I actually, it turns out I misinterpreted what the question was asking. Um, the 18, like question five on the very last section on 18.5, I think it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think actually the solution, I feel like the solution guide misinterpreted the question. Oh, really? I guess it I could be that. It, I didn't do it, but I thought it was asking to like basically generalize the assignment finder and for any like user specified function name. That's what I thought too. But, but then the solution was like, now we're just gonna find every single call. And I was like, that seems like overkill. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, because the specified is what made me think like user specified. Right. Yeah. Did you work on it? No, I didn't. Do it. I um di didn't read it until today, so I like try not to take up too much time <laughs> just yeah, reading same. during the day. Um, what about you, June? Yeah, I'll, anything I you know? the exercises a try, um, but I do have kind of a question um, yeah. about like capturing calls. Do you know if the variables when they're captured do is like the is it sensitive to like where it gets evaluated? You know how kind of like promises are also capturing like environments where like things are defined or at least like declared um i know like it's probably not the case the same case with calls because you can just like declare a variable or like have pass in like strings um and maybe that's not sensitive to like the environment where like a string was defined such that like if you part if you like turn that into like an expression um then like you look back at where you define the string to find a variable or whatever um but yeah just wondering. So maybe this is related to your question. There was an example with like median and X. And it was like four, I think it was an exercise. There was like four different versions and it was like compare and contrast for call two. Um, what was that? Oh, exercise three in section expression. And it kind of showed how, like, if you didn't wrap things, like the string X, it did look in your local environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, it will, an expression doesn't attach an environment, whereas an enclosure does, um, like an in quo. 
in Quo is just basically an expression with an environment attached to it. Uh, so it carries the environment in which it's defined such that it can use variables in that environment, whereas an expression is agnostic and is gonna take the environment that it's either evaluated in, or you can like specify an environment explicitly when you call eval or eval bear, eval tidy, whatever one you choose. I see. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good question. So it's gonna use whatever variables are there in the parent frame whenever you call eval. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get my computer connected to this so I can share my screen with the number five thing. I think I kind of did what it asked for. I didn't really go to much effort to like test edge cases, but I got it to work on one example. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the one exception to that though is if your evaluation actually uses like a function that was declared in the environment for which it came, because a function is gonna carry along its environment, like we learned from the functions chapter. So if your expression happens to include a function, I think it's gonna carry the environment with it. And if whatever function, however that function is called, it's gonna use the invariables that it came from its definition. I also learned a really weird, bizarre thing over the past week about how RDS, like from last week, I think I talked about how RDS, when you save RDS, it like, if you save a function, the file size is like huge, like far bigger than it looks like the function is. And apparently what happens inside of RDS somehow is like, it's a C function at the bottom of it. And it basically looks at the symbol and it finds the enclosing environment in which it was defined. And what, what it means by defined is literally like where it was written. Even if you like write a function and save that to like an empty environment, the function itself is going to inherit in its enclosing environment, the variables that are around in the like file that it was written. Like if you sourced it, it's going to have all those variables. And so RDS actually goes and serializes that entire environment and saves everything. in. So if you have like big objects in there, it's going to write all of that into the RDS file at the same time. But this functionality might have actually changed between like 403, R403 uh, taking off. And then it's like 403 something else, which is like bunnies something. It's like the latest, it's called like bunnies flipping out or something like that. Bunny wannies uh, freak out. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, bunny <laughs> wannies freak out, yeah. Because... <laughs> uh, I was working with somebody who's using that new version and we were both like doing the exact same code. And my RDS file was like 28 megabytes and theirs was like 16 kilobytes. And so the only thing I can figure is like RDS somehow changed. And like my version was like serializing the environment and her version was not, it was super puzzling. And I don't fully understand what's happening in like the C the C code and save RDS, but we just kind of circumvented it altogether. 
Um, there's, I learned about an interesting function though in Arlang as a remedy for this issue, which is Arlang FN underscore ENV function environment. And it allows you to like explicitly specify a function environment. Um, so if you want it to like inherit and take with it a new environment that's specifically tailored, you can do that with that function, which is useful in some cases. Uh, one sec. I think, let me find my files not open anymore. I started working on next week's presentation because there's a massive amount of information in that chapter and it's kind of intimidating. Very long. <laughs> yeah. You think, you think it'll all fit in one meeting? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Okay, so so I was trying to figure out how to do that thing. think I think this works we'll see um all right I took something out but I think it will still work so um, I need to All right, Let's see if this works. And if so, I can explain it. Ugh. Okay, it works. So I interpreted it the same way you did, Torin, um, which is we want to take a user specified like pattern and match the function name. Um, so made this thing call match logical, which uses per when, and it looks for if an object inherits the name class, then deparse that part of the expression and use like grepl like logical matching uh, regex match to see if that that name line uh, includes the specified pattern otherwise return false um, so this is actually the first time I've ever used r apply and I just used it because there's really no good solution for recursively applying to a list of unknown depth because uh, per map depth, you have to specify the depth. Um, and there's like vec depth where you can get the depth returned as an integer, but it actually breaks as does map depth. They both break if uh, any of the things in a list are a call or a name. And I don't know if that's intentional, but I opened an issue on per about it because it mm -hmm. seems odd that it would just break when there's a call or a name in there. So our apply recursively maps over a nested list. And so we convert the expression to a list and then we recursively apply as list. Um, and we want 
a nested list as an output. That's kind of what Hal does. It says give a nested output. Otherwise, it will uh, unlist it, and it'll be just like a, a vector. So I'm going to run this, like debug this, so we can see each of these things like happening in real time. So is this is my screen visible, by the way? Should I make this bigger? Mm -hmm. Okay, so run this. So it looks like this. So we get like that function turns into the first function is like the, the bracket, the curly brace, which is signifying that there's an expression coming. And then the first one is like function and then it's arguments and then per reduce and then it's arguments and then uh, dot F it's other argument. And so uh, we can recursively map over that and call our custom function or apply call match logical pattern, how list. And that's going to give us a, um, a list with whether or not that it shows whether or not there is a match with the function name that we specified. And so we can see that number two has it. So I just mapped any on that to get a top level view of which function or which uh, part of that list of calls or that list of expressions has it in there. And then subsetted calls by it. So subset calls. And the little parentheses or curly braces of a pipe is useful when you don't want the first argument to be what you piped in from the left-hand side. Because if you don't have the curly braces, it's going to pipe your first argument into the first slot on your function, no matter what. So if you want to avoid that and put it in the second slot, you have to use the curly braces. So that in turn returns the, the second list item. And then we can just, and this is where like it would break if there was like a more deeply nested list, I think. Uh, but for now this works. It returns this like list item, the second one that was function 12. So can go through and we can see call here is looks like that. And so we want to convert it back to a call as the output. So we can specify the first object in that list, which is always the function to call to. And then we can use, this comes from next chapter, but like the bang, bang, bang operator that expands a list into like ordered or named arguments if they are named. And so we just, subtract out the function and whatever's left, we're going to expand that as the arguments to the function. So when we do that, it comes back to us as that function call. And I don't know if it would work if there were like more than one either. That might break it too, but whatever. It was an exercise. <laughs> Yeah, so that was challenging, but at least it, yeah, so vec depth, let me see, if I just like do this, do this. So if you go like vec depth on this, it does, it gives you that, like must be a vector, uh, which kind of sucks. And so, Is it? Mm. So I proposed this, added some things to vec depth. This will actually work. Basically, it just like looks if it's a call or a list, then we're going to recursively map as list and vec depth over it. 
And if it's a symbol or a function, we're just going to add one layer of depth to vec depth. And so if we do that, we can do vec depth and then call. Oops, one sec, I got to load our leg. Uh, what? Oh, it's calls. Oh, God. <laughs> this is what happens when you take something out of its native environment and try to abuse it. Okay. So now, okay, there. So it works. Back depth calls gives the, gives the depth there. And the reason it says four is because we added the so the original thing looks like this. And so you would think three, right? It's got top level lists, and then there's this level of list, and then there's this level of list. So it should be three, but because this is a call, we have a couple of calls in here. Like this is a call. It's gonna go down uh, one step further by converting that. Where's the thing there? So it's gonna convert that call to a list. And so it's gonna create one more level of, of depth there. We can actually debug it and see how that works. Doop, 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 doop. So this first one is just that. So it's gonna add one layer. We need to actually it's recursive, so we need to debug it because debug once is going to do it once. So it adds one layer of depth, recurses over again. X this time is the curly bracket, recurse again. X this time. Is still the curly bracket, I guess. Now it's on this one. So now it's going to map over that. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. It works. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was fun. We'll see what they say. If they're like, nope, that's going to break everything upstream, which is probably what they're going to say, because I'm probably not thinking of like half the problems that that's going to cause, but seems useful. Anybody else have any R wins this week? No. No. Anybody else have any non-R wins? Well, this is sort of R win, but um, if you saw like the R Studio announcement about font support um, and like tech support uh, being kind of like revamped um, in like the upcoming update, there's like a little um, lesser known um, like a graphics device package from um, Arlib, it's SVG Lite and it like renders SVG files or like images, I guess. Um, and that one in particular is going to be super relevant um, for like making like sharing and presentations or like for blogs um, because SVG Lite um, is doing this new thing where like you don't need basically it, it adds font support without having to add a bunch of a lot of um, like size to the image. Um, so like previously you would have to change the font file into like base 64 encoding and then like add it as part of the like SVG file, um, which makes it super big. Um, but SVG like doesn't do that, but still supports like custom fonts on your like operating system. Um, and so like all my, like I just gave it a try. Um, and so like all my images that used to be like PNG um, and like 200, 300 DPI um, like resolution were like 60, 70 kilobytes. That's like down to like six or seven. Um, wow. And it's like scalable. So like, you know, there's no such thing as resolution. You can zoom in as much as you want. And like the prop and the um, 
you know, qualities preserved. Um, and so that's going to be super useful for me going forward in like presentations and stuff because I um, do some like data visualization stuff at, well, grad school. <laughs> People ask me to make data visualizations in R. So um, that's I cool. SVG. Is that going to, is that, is that kind of, is that a package SVG Lite? Yeah, SVG Lite is a package. Um, I checked out the dev version. I don't know if like all the changes with the fonts have been released, um, but I figured they have like an unreleased version that has a bunch of changes. Um, so I just downloaded or installed the dev version um, and everything like works fine. Like custom fonts work fine. This file sizes are tiny, um, which is... Very nice. That's awesome. Are they going to like integrate that into ggplot? Because it seems like that would be a place where it would be really useful. I think there's they're talking about making like rag um, the default. So like the rag is like, I don't know if you all know, but it's like the PNG um, device or like I think it renders other stuff too, but mainly for PNG. Um, and it's like supposedly the better like cousin of not cousin, but like better than Cairo, which was like the GG save default. Um, so they're, they're considering making ag the default instead, but SVG I think will just kind of be like, uh, like on the side, you can like use this as you want kind of a deal because you can't really, because SVGs are not like bitmap, um, like you can't, yeah, like you have to kind of capture it into a PNG to do, to like pass it around as like an image um, but yeah. SVG renders yeah. well in like web pages and in web context. Um, yeah, it seems like Plotly actually, now that I think about it, like Plotly that would be really useful for because they rely heavily on SVG to display the Plotly's. Like I have a, I don't know, but that, I think that's just because of data, but I have this one RMD document that uses a lot of Plotly uh, spatial graphs. And the RMD document is like 1.3 gigabytes because there's a couple of like spatial maps. And I'm just like, it takes so long to render and just load when you try to load it up. And I feel like there's gotta be a better way to like reduce the file size there. I use the like Plotly reduction like plotly light function that basically eliminates scripts that you don't need it doesn't like bundle the entire plotly library um but it's still like an enormous enormous file and i wonder if that could help with it yeah i would give it a try it doesn't hurt it's pretty simple to use cool I tried to use the SAS package today. Are, are, is anybody, does anybody use SAS or is familiar with SAS? Uh, I do not like SAS, but. Why not? I have used to, SAS, hate to. I, I just don't like it. <laughs> to me it's it too. It gives you like a book every time you run one procedure. It like has like 30 pages of output. It's ridiculous not flexible that's my major complaint it's like you have to it has to be this way or it doesn't work and that way it's like there's too much to put in and so but mm. i had to learn it in our like courses because i think they're phasing it out for python now but like my first year it was still like oh, taught right. for industry Okay, we're, we're confusing uh, SAS SAS and SASS SAS. Um, I was asking about SASS SAS. <laughs> Not the uh, proprietary SAS like data science thing out of North Carolina. Is the other SAS with the 2S a package? Uh, it is, there's a package for it, yeah. It's like, um, it's like a styling shorthand oh, for CSS. functionality mm. yeah now yeah, we're talking about this <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the, the expensive SAS. SAS. <laughs> yeah the, the bane of data science um <laughs> yeah i tried using it today and it doesn't work 
<laughs> when you have like more than one property for a particular uh, class, not class, but like a particular selector, like if you specify more than one property, it just doesn't work. And I was like, well, uh, this is not so useful. <laughs> it's like a major limitation. Yeah, I don't really know anything about CSS. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I realized that I could just like change it to an SCSS file. And for some reason that works fine. Like the SAS interpreter can interpret the SCSS as well. And for some reason that worked fine. I don't know why the SAS didn't work, but it did. not Is that for a shiny app or something like that? Uh, I might use it for a shiny app. I don't know. Uh, maybe eventually if I have the use case for it. Um, but I just used it to style a couple of things in the presentation I'm making for next week. Yeah. It's a lot easier to use than R, obviously, because it's just like, it's like arranging flowers. You're just telling things how to look, <laughs> dressing them up, basically. <laughs> Well, is that everything, guys? Gals? I think so. All right. Thanks for presenting, Roberto. I guess I'll be yeah, presenting thanks. next week. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's kind of like the whole reason why I joined the book club. It's like, I just want to get a quasi quotation right. Like, everyone's talking about it. <laughs> Feel like i really need to learn it so yeah i've used it a little bit but there's a lot in that chapter that i do not understand so it will be interesting for sure definitely read the chapter because mm -hmm. there there will likely be things that i will ask for help on to better understand all right well everybody have a good uh afternoon evening depending on where you are <laughs> late night i guess like head into bed now yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> thanks Thank you, everyone yeah Bye. don't forget the homework i'll be waiting <laughs> for those yeah Bye. i read it i read it all before i did it pre-work well done extra case for you yeah <laughs> thanks bye-bye right.